The following video may contain sensitive topics. The views and opinions of the presenter to these are plainly his own. Furthermore, any and all views and opinions of the presenter do not, in any way, reflect the views, opinions, statements, and advocacies of his personal contacts, his family, his affiliations, and his profession. While the presenter makes a commitment that all content is original, he is obliged to cite references or acknowledge resources mentioned or used in the production of this video. This disclaimer is also written in the description below. Well, normally I am uh, going to uh, record this uh, with a microphone sa, uh, on my, ano, on my, uh, uh, my computer, but then again, I was thinking, nah, I'm not gonna do that. I'm, uh, I just have to sort this out. I just have to, uh, get this off, uh, and, um, uh, you know, get over with it. So, uh, this is the long-awaited part three of the Autism in the Philippines series. And um, it's not gonna be the Eraserheads thing. Uh, hayaan ko muna magana yan. I'll, I have to uh, get this first so that uh, we can be in line with the production. And uh, it's coming up to April, so I might as well just, uh, no, I might as well just uh, end up with uh, the Eraserheads uh, songs. And uh, maybe, uh, you know get uh, that uh, sorted out. Bahala na ha. I I'm not, ano, I'm not really doing something. But anyway, uh, cue intro, let's get this show going. <laughs> Hi, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I'm Intrepid Ian Renyon, an independent alternative media practitioner among other things. If you're returning from one of my previous videos, welcome back. And uh, this is another video that you're going to watch. And uh, I am inviting you to uh, uh, discover some of my content as well. So uh, if you want to check out more of my videos, uh, check out my channel, Intrepid Ian Reñon. If you like what you're uh, seeing right now or some of the videos that I have, uh, I would appreciate the like. And uh, if you, you can also subscribe to this channel, ring the notification bell by selecting all, and share this video around if you really if you really wanted to uh, uh, to help me out. So uh, last year, I have created a two par uh, uh, two parts of my uh, supposedly three part now four part uh, autism in the Philippines uh, series. And it's more focused about my own suspicions. Again, I would just like to tell you, I would like to have this disclaimer that I am no doctor. I am not someone who is into psychology. I'm not a mental health professional. I just had these suspicions. And again, it's a journey. If if it isn't, um, if it isn't autism, then it's absolutely fine as long as I you know, as long as uh, I got. I get my brain sorted out. But for now, these are my suspicions. And uh, the suspicions that I have in the, the previous videos would stay as it is uh, unless proven otherwise by a mental health professional. So uh, again, suspicions are not uh, full diagnoses. Uh, I see them as stepping stones towards a formal diagnosis. If it's not real autism, it's fine. But as it is, there's suspicions that uh, I'm uh, I'm part of the autistic community. So uh, that disclaimer out of the way. Let's uh, let's get this uh, let's get this video going. Now you may be wondering why. The topic about autism here in the Philippines is few is really you know is really uh, still misunderstood by a lot of people, and maybe it's because uh, of our society, our neurotypical society, and some of them are just either ignorant or refuse and or they refuse to uh, acknowledge that uh, children grow into adults and these adults would uh, discover in themselves that they were uh, 
that they were different all along. There are children who are not diagnosed in their childhood and they only get to uh, realize that something's up in their brains uh, later in life, early 20s or late 20s, even in their 30s, 40s, or even at the end of their lives. Kumbaga, they are about to die, to die and uh, they only knew that they have been living with this condition all along. Uh, they have been autistic all along and they never understood it until they are already grandparents and they see their autistic their, their autistic traits on their grandchildren. So uh, that's, uh, that's actually... Uh, something that I really wanted to talk about because parents of Filipino autistic children are always in denial of this or they are always in the drama mood. I understand that they are, um, that they're very much concerned with what or uh, how will their children grow up. It's their children. They wanted to have the best for their children. So they just wanted to have... uh, a say on things. But then again, uh, there are parents of autistic children who are saying that, that I really wish my child is neurotypical. They are not saying it verbatim, but they may say it in their own minds. And as early as 1993, 30 years ago, an autistic person named Jim Sinclair who founded Autism Network International, or ANI, has created an essay piece addressed to parents of autistic children and see autism in the lens of adults who knew they are autistic. As someone who has has been suspecting, or if ever in the future I am not, but I'm someone who is uh, someone who supports or someone who wants to help autistic adults, autistic Filipino adults uh, to uh, be heard in our society, I think it's better for us to read this. I'm going to link, link it in the description below, the, the essay that is. And uh, I would let you uh, I would let you share it out so uh, so that you can read it for yourself. But I am going to read it to you at this point, I hope this would not be a very uh, long video, but perhaps it's going to be bahala na. Now, a little bit of context. So, so Jim Sinclair, as I said, is um, an autistic adult who founded ANI or the Autism Network International. And since 2013, ha- I mean, and, si- and since then, have uh, created these retreats for autistics. The last one was 10 years ago in 2013. And uh, from what I have read in Reddit, it went sideways. So uh, I'm not delving into that. But then again, A&I and Jim Sinclair uh, created the neurodiversity movement that we know uh, as we know it today. And uh, this essay of his, uh, I'm... I don't know how, what gender uh, Jim Sinclair is identifying as, but but for me, Jim Sinclair uh, sounds male to me, so I'm gonna refer to him as him, his or him, whatever. So, um, nabasa ko dyan, okay? Uh, you can uh, tell me in the comments below uh, if if I'm wrong, but for me, Jim Sinclair Sinclair look uh, sounds male to me, so I'm gonna address him as he is. Uh, so that's it. So yun lang naman. So uh, uh, it's not even, uh, it's not even, uh, it's not even uh, s- something that we should talk about. Uh, may bang, that, it's a topic for another day. So let's get, to, uh, let's get this sorted out. So this, I'm going to read uh, uh, Sinclair's essay entitled Don't Mourn for us. Uh, This has been written in English. There's also a translation in Spanish. But there's no translation in Tagalog. So 
I am also trying to um, translate that as well and maybe record it in uh, in Tagalog. But if there are there are people who would like to uh, translate this in the other Philippine languages, please do let me know so that I can also um, share it out here on uh, on my channel, so that uh, so that people can understand in their own local languages. Let me go ahead and uh, screen the, uh, um, sort this out, and uh, I'll read it to you right now. Jim Sinclair wrote. Parents often report that learning their child is autistic was the most traumatic thing that ever happened to them. Non-autistic people see autism as a great tragedy, and parents experience continuing disappointment and grief at all stages of the child's and family's life cycle. But this grief does not stem from the child's autism in itself. It is grief over the loss of the normal child the parents had hoped and expected to have. Parents' attitudes and expectations and the discrepancies between what parents expect of children at a particular age and their own child's actual development cause more stress and anguish than the practical complexities of life with an autistic person. Some amount of grief is natural as parents adjust to the fact that an event and a relationship they've been looking forward to isn't going to materialize. But this grief over a fantasized normal child needs to be separated from the parents' perceptions of the children they do have. The autistic child who needs the support of adult caretakers who can, who can form very meaningful relationships with those caretakers if given the opportunity. Continuing focus on the child's autism for both the parents and the child and precludes the development of an accepting and authentic relationship between them for their own sake and for the sake of their children. I urge parents to make radical changes in their perceptions of what autism means. Jim Simter says, I invite you to look at our autism and look at your grief from our perspective because autism is not an appendage. Autism isn't something a person has or a shell a shell that a person is trapped inside. There's no normal child hidden behind the autism. Autism is a way of being. It is pervasive. It colors every experience, every sensation, perception, thought, emotion, and encounter, every aspect of existence. It is not possible to separate the autism from the person. And if it were possible, the person you'd have, le have left would not be the same person you started with. This is important. So take a moment to consider it. Autism is a way of being. It is not possible to separate the person from the autism. Therefore, when parents say, I wish my child didn't have autism, what they're really saying is, I wish the autistic child I have did not exist and I had a different non-autistic child instead. Think about it. Rewind this video and uh, go, to the, uh, go to the part that I said those things. This is what we hear when you mourn over our existence, uh, as Sinclair said here. This is what we hear when you pray for a cure. This is what we know when you tell us of your fondest hopes and dreams for us, that your greatest wish is that one day we will cease to be and strangers you can love will move in behind our faces. But you know, autism is not an impenetrable wall. You try to relate to your autistic child and the child doesn't respond. He doesn't see you, you can't reach her, there's no getting through. That's the hardest thing to deal with, isn't it? The only thing is, it isn't nature. You try to relate as a parent, as a par as parent to child, using your own understanding of normal children, your own feelings about parenthood, your own experiences and intuitions about relationships, and the child doesn't respond in any way you can recognize 
as being part of that system. That does not mean the child is incapable of relating at all. It only means you're assuming a shared system, a shared understanding of signals and meanings that that the child in fact does not share. It's as if you try to have an intimate conversation with someone who has no comprehension of your language. Of course, the person won't understand what you're talking about, won't respond in the way you expect, and may well find the whole interaction confusing and unpleasant. It takes more work to communicate with someone whose native language isn't the same as yours. And autism goes deeper than language and culture. Autistic people are foreigners in any society. You're going to have to give up your assumptions about shared meanings. You're going to have to learn back, learn to back up to levels more than basic than you've probably thought about before to translate and to check to make sure your translations are understood. Jim Sinclair also tells parents, you're going to have to give up the certainty that comes of being your own being on your own familiar territory if knowing you're in charge of knowing you're in charge and let your child teach you a little of her language and guide you a little way into his world. And the outcome, if you succeed, still will not be a normal parent-child relationship. Your autistic child may learn to talk, may attend regular classes in school, may go to college, drive a car, live independently, have a career, but will never relate to you as other children relate to their parents. Or your autistic child may never speak, may graduate from a self-contained special education classroom to a sheltered activity program or or a residential facility may need lifelong full-time care and supervision, but is not completely beyond your reach. The ways we relate are different, uh, uh, Jim Sinclair wrote. Push for the things your expectations tell you are normal and you'll find frustration, disappointment, resentment, maybe even rage and hatred. Approach respectfully without preconceptions and with openness to learning new things and you'll find a world you could never have imagined. Yes, that takes more work than relating to a non-autistic person, but it can be done. Unless non-autistic people are far more limited than we are in their capacity to relate. Jim Sinclair uh, continues, We spend our entire lives doing it. Each of us who does learn to talk to you Each of us who manages to function at all in your society, each of us who manages to reach out and make a connection with you, is operating in alien territory, making contact with alien beings. We spend our entire lives doing this, uh, Jim Sinclair says. And then you tell us we can't relate. And Jim Sinclair has this third idea. And he says... Autism is not death. Granted, autism isn't what most parents expect or look forward to when they anticipate the arrival of a child. What they expect is a child who will be like them, who will share their world and relate to them without requiring intensive on-the-job training in alien contact. Even if their child has some disability over than autism, parents expect to be able to relate to that child on the terms that seem normal to them, and in most cases, even allowing for the limitations of various disabilities, it is possible to form the kind of bond the parents had been looking forward to. But not when the child is autistic, Jim Sinclair uh, laments. Much of the grieving parents do is over the non-occurrence of the expected relationship with an expected normal child. This grief is very real and it needs to be expected and worked through so people can get on with their lives. But it has nothing, I repeat, nothing to do with autism. What it comes down to is that you expected something that was tremendously important to you and you looked forward to it with great joy and excitement and maybe for a while you thought you actually had it. And then perhaps gradually, perhaps abruptly, you had to recognize that the thing you looked forward to hasn't happened. 
it isn't going to happen. No matter how many other normal children you have, nothing will change the fact that this time, the child you waited and hoped and planned and dreamed for didn't arrive. This is the same thing that parents experience when a child is stillborn or when they have their baby to hold for a short time only to have it die in infancy. It isn't about autism, Jim Sinclair writes. It's about shattered expectations. He suggests here that the best place to address these issues is not in organizations devoted to autism, but in parental bereavement counseling and support groups. In those settings, parents learn to come to terms with their loss, not to forget about it, but to let it be in the past, where the grief doesn't hit them in the face every waking moment of their lives. They learn to accept that their child is gone forever and won't be coming back. Most importantly, they learn not to take out their grief for the lost child and their surviving children. This is of critical importance when one of those surviving children arrived at the time the child being mourned for died. Dear parents, you didn't lose a child to autism, Jim Sinclair writes. You lost the child because the child you waited for never came to existence. That isn't the fault of the autistic child who does exist, and it shouldn't be our burden. We need and deserve families who can see us and value us for ourselves, not families whose vision of us is obscured by the ghosts of children who never lived. Grieve if you must for your own lost dreams. But don't mourn for us. Dear parents, we are alive, we are real, and we're here waiting for you. This is what I think autism societies should be about. And Jim Sinclair says, it is not mourning for what never was, but exploration of what is. He says, we need you. We need your help and your understanding. Your world is not very open to us and we won't make it without your strong support. Yes, there is tragedy that comes with autism, not because of what we are, but because of the things that happen to us. Be sad about that if you want to be sad about something. Better than being sad about it, though, get mad about it. And then do something about it. I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! The tragedy is not that we're here, as he says, as uh, Jim Sinclair says, but that your world has no place for us to be. How can it be otherwise as long as our own parents are still grieving over having brought us into the world? And Jim Sinclair advises parents this. Take a look at your ch autistic child sometime and take a moment to tell yourself who that child is not. Think to yourself, This is not my child that I expected and planned for. This is not the child I waited through all those months of pregnancy and all those hours of labor. This is not the child I made all those plans to share all those experiences with. That child never came. This is not that child. Then, go do whatever grieving you have to do away from the autistic child. And Jim Sinclair uh, emphasizes that the grieving must be done away from the autistic child. Don't ever uh, let the child uh, let uh, children see you grieving for what that autistic child is not uh, but uh, these are own, my own words okay that's just me and start learning to let go after you've started that letting go come back and look at your autistic child again and say to yourself this is not my child that I expected and planned for this is an alien child who landed in my life by accident. I don't know who this child is or what it will become, but I know it's a child stranded in an alien world without parents of its own to kind of its own kind to care for it. It needs someone to care for it, to teach it, to interpret and to advocate for it. And because this alien child happened to drop into my life, that job is mine if I want it. And Jim Sinclair concludes if that prospect excites you, then come join us. 
in strength and determination, in hope and in joy. The adventure of a lifetime is ahead of you. And that, my friends, is the, the essay written by Jim Sinclair called Don't Mourn for Us. I know this is a little bit outdated, but you know, 30 years um, 30 years since or uh, 30 years after this um, piece was written, I, methinks it's still relevant. It is still relevant because in our in our society, in the society that we, li- we live in here in the Philippines, a lot of parents of autistic children are still in the denial stage. They are grieving, of course. And in, this, in those five stages of grief, they are still here in denial. Perhaps 75% of them are here. Around 10% are in the middle stages of anger, bargaining, and depression. And then only around 5%, uh, let's just say 20% of the people of the people are in the in are in the in in the in between. Um, anger, bargaining, and depression, and only 5% of parents of autistic children have accepted that their children are autistic. And in those 5%, a handful are thinking. Maybe, the, maybe I'm autistic because uh, maybe they're autistic because I'm autistic. So there's a lot. There's a long way to go, and uh, I guess that's just uh, what I'm going to leave you uh, leave you right now. So I think that's it for this uh, for this video. And if you if you appreciate what I've uh, done here. I hope you would subscribe to this channel, ring the notification bell by selecting all, share this around, and like it uh, so that the algorithm would reach uh, a lot of people. <laughs> not just uh, no, not just the people uh, who will subscribe to me. And please um, help me uh, help me out in uh, in getting into at least five hundred subscribers before this year ends. Yun lang naman. But anyway. I'm cutting it here. Baka mag na yung ano ko, cell phone ko. So, with all that said, this is the Intrepidian Rinyon reminding you to, at all times, be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Until then, look alive, stay alive, be kind to yourself and to each other, and as always, thank you for watching. From here in Intrepid HQ, see you next time. Ian out. Ay, hindi ko alam kung <laughs> gano'n katagal to pero bahala na. <laughs>